ballots and how to lay the ballots out. Um, software to help staff adjudicate write-in ballots and to record that information. And also aggregating and totaling all the ballots and, as well as reporting the results to the public. And then in addition, the, the hardware components have their own software, like a scanner would need to have software to um, tell it how to run. And similarly, the accessible voting device has to uh, have software to, to um, control that. So these are all the, the types of um, you know, software and hardware components that can go into a voting system. So you know, what are the problems that open source voting is, is meant to solve? Like, what are some of these problems today? Well, the first one is, is very obvious to us, and that is that voting systems are very expensive in today's model. You know, and I'll just use the example of San Francisco because it's what I'm most familiar with. In San Francisco, we're using the same system we, we purchased back in 2008, and we, are, we spend an average of around $2 million a year on that system. And it's, today, it's, it's 10 years old, and we're still spending $2 million a year on it. And it was $10 million up front, and then another million dollars each year for things like licensing fees and service contracts and maintenance. And then, to give you an idea, at the state scale, there's a bond measure working its way through the legislature. It's a $450 million bond measure to provide matching funds to counties. And if you're to add in the, the money that counties would spend, it totals to between 600 and $675 million. So this is huge amounts of money that is going towards voting systems. And then the other um, things are, these systems are not transparent. They're completely uh, secret, proprietary. Members of the public can't see the software code that's running. And also the systems, you know, you, you pay all this money, but they might not even have the features you want. I know there's a lot of better auditing practices that these systems could support, but they don't necessarily support them. Or the designs could be, um, you know, the usability could be poor. And because these systems are controlled by companies, this, a city or county can't even make a simple change if they'd like to improve things. So it really holds back innovation. And then a, a couple other problems today are that there just aren't very many options, and we've heard some of the speakers talk about this. There's only three major companies right now in the country, and it's very difficult for new um, companies to break into the market. And then lastly, when you do acquire a system, you, you have very little flexibility. Um, you're kind of locked into that system, and then it's designed so that when it's at the end of its life, you can't really gradually you know, um, improve certain parts of it. You basically need to buy an entirely new system with another huge price tag. And then, in the course of servicing the equipment over the years, oftentimes you're limited to just only having that one company service the equipment instead of having, you know, possibly many people that could um, provide services in the equipment. So, what is the solution to this? It's the idea that these systems, they shouldn't necessarily be a, you know, a commercial product for companies to make money, but we could view it as, I mean, this could be a shared public resource and make voting systems a part of our public infrastructure. In the example I, you know, I like to use are things like libraries or parks or roads. These are things in the public interest and for something like our democracy, it seems like that's a worthy goal. So how do we you know, make this idea concrete of a, something that's a public shared resource? Well, the, the, the term is open source software. And I'll give you the technical definition first, and then we'll go into the meaning of it. But basically, all it means is that the software has a license that is OSI approved. Now, OSI, the Open Source Initiative, is a nonprofit that certifies whether licenses are, are truly open source. Kind of like if you had a, um, a certifying agency for like organic food or something. And, um, and a license, really all it is, is an agreement that the soft owner of the software provides along with the software that give you the terms for under, what, under which you're allowed to use the software. So uh, two examples of open source software you might be familiar with are the Firefox browser. You know, as you all know, you can download it for free. And if you wanted to, you can look at the source code. And another one is the Linux operating system, which is the alternative to Windows and Mac. And it's a completely free, it's um, software is also available to the public. <clears throat> now, what does this mean informally, open source? Well, there's three components to it. One is that anyone can view the code, 
which gets at the transparency issue. Anyone can use it for free, which is why it becomes more affordable. And then thirdly, which is kind of the, one of the neatest aspects, is that anyone can make a copy of the so software and then make changes or improvements to it. So if a, a county were to acquire an open source system, they needed to make some adjustments to how they do their elections, they would be free to make those modifications instead of being sort of at the mercy of whether or not the company would, would make the change. So it really gives a lot more freedom to um, the jurisdiction that's running the election. And then there's also like another um, kind of one more little bonus thing that you could do. And some open source software licenses are what are called, or what's called copy left. And this is an extra condition where if someone was to make a change to the open source, legally the changes also have to be open source under those same terms. So it ensures that this, the software stays open forever so that, um, because if you didn't have that condition, someone could maybe make changes to the software and then start selling it for money. So um, that's sort of like a bonus um, characteristic you could have. And it's not just the software that we want to have open source. We also want to have the hardware be affordable as well. So for example, maybe using commercial off-the-shelf hardware components like a scanner that um, you, know, you might use in other industries, you know, high volume scanners or, or um, you know, conventional desktops that you can buy very cheaply could be used for an accessible voting device. And then the other component is um, in addition to the hardware and the software, you also have, you want all your documentation around the software to be openly licensed. Because if you have an open source voting system, it doesn't help if you don't have the instructions on how to use it or, or how to test it or, um, or how it's built. So it's also important that, that these supplementary materials are open. So um, where are we in San Francisco? This is a, an idea that goes back to 2005. Um, activists like yourself um, kind of brought this idea to the attention of the county. And it's been an ongoing discussion. And, and over the years, there's sort of been more and more um, momentum building. You know, reports have been written. Um, there was a report in 2011 that was um, recommended open source voting. It's a task force that was formed by the Board of Supervisors. And then in 2014, this is when things really started to change, the Board of Supervisors passed unanimously a resolution to support the idea of San Francisco building an open source system. And then in the following year, when I was president of the Elections Commission, we passed a, a also a unanimous resolution, basically asking the city to fund the development of, a, of the system. And um, in that process, um, we're going to the budget uh, season to uh, get the project funded, and then we developed a lot of supporters from the community. And this um, supporter list is currently on a website I'll be sharing with you a little bit later. But um, you know, it's, it's quite a large uh, number of groups that are in support. Um, the Voting Race Task Force in the East Bay is, is one of the groups. And then, um, you know, the, more recently, in 2016, you know, leading into that, that budget season, the Mayor and Board of Supervisors uh, did allocate $300,000 of money towards the planning phase of the project, which is basically to have a, a third party assess approximately how much time it would take to build a system, what types of, um, how much it would cost, and w what are some of the steps that, you know, the city would need to take to actually get to, to building the system. <clears throat> and uh, the, um, so that money was allocated. And then, and then uh, last spring, the commission that I'm a member of, we formed in a, this technical advisory committee. It's five members from the public who all have various um, technical backgrounds or from the open source community. Um, you know, one of, uh, Rowan Katow is here today. He's a member of that committee. And I should also say, um, Roger Donaldson is also here today. He was a member of the task force, Roger, and also a member of the Elections Commission. And then Jim Soper, one of the organizers, was also a member of the task force. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Roger. So yeah, their, their work is bearing fruit a little bit later, but um, it's happening. And, uh, you know, and lastly, this, this RFP for this planning phase was finally issued earlier this summer, and then they're in the final days of awarding the contract to a consulting firm called Slalom, 
who uh, has an office in San Francisco and offices across the country. And they are going to be working on a report that will do, be due in January on, um, on you know, outlining the types of things I said earlier. So, you know, between now and when this report is issued in January, I just kind of want to go over with you, you know, what's going to be happening. Um, so the, the commission continues to meet every month, and there's also a committee of the commission that meets every month. That, and also this um, technical advisory committee meets every month. And this technical advisory committee is making recommendations that, are, um, that the public can give feedback on to kind of help shape and influence the system in a, in a positive direction. And then, uh, so when this report is issued in January 2018, that's around the same time that San Francisco's next budget season is gonna start. And that's the point where we wanna have a lot of community support so that the mayor will actually fund the beginning of the development of the, of the system. And um, the other thing that's kind of happening in parallel with this is that our current system that we acquired back in 2008, the contract for that is ending at the end of 2018. So we're gonna need to have some kind of interim system that the, that the city uses while the open source voting system is being developed. So it kind of remains to be seen what that will look like. Um, some of the ways that you can help. So for people that are not local, you could uh, follow a Twitter account that we have for this project. It's called SF Open Voting. And we've got um, nearly 200 followers. And there's also a website that just went up in the past week that has, um, starting to have more information added to it, sfopenvoting.org. Just to kind of, you can go there to get the latest on where the, the project is at. You can um, meet with me and just sign up with me to receive uh, updates on the, the project each month. And for example, if there's an important meeting that it's important for members of the public to be at, I can, I can let you know about those meetings. And then this uh, technical advisory committee, it's um, open for public feedback. We have, for those of that, you that are technical, we have, um, it's kind of like a, almost like an open source development project in itself because the document that we're working on is available on a website that software developers use to maintain code and anyone could submit a, a suggestion for wording and then it can be um, using the same tools that open source software developers use. And then just, um, you know, spread the word to people you know. Maybe this is uh, new to, you know, some of you and, and it's probably new to many of your, the people that you work on issues with. So you can let, this know, let them know this is an option because if San Francisco is successful at developing and certifying the system, it's a system that anyone in the country would be able to use at a much more affordable um, cost. And, and like I said, it, it would be, anyone would be able to make improvements to it to, to make it fit your own jurisdiction. And then lastly, you know, one thing that can help us and help you would be to build interest in your own community. Like if you were to pass a resolution in your community, that would help us because it shows the people leading San Francisco that there's interest elsewhere in the country. And, um, and then you know, there's a lot of synergy when you start to have more jurisdictions um, you know, working towards a common goal like this. So I've got my contact information listed here, both my commission contact information as well as uh, my personal contact information and the links to the Elections Commission and the Advisory Committee's websites. So, thank you. Hello? Yes, okay. So you were mentioning public-private partnerships, but don't we want it to all be public and shouldn't we get all of the voting systems out of the private industry and how can we get there? Okay, well I don't, I don't know if I actually mentioned a public-private partnership, but um, I think as long as the, my opinion is that as long as the, the software code is open source, it doesn't actually mean matter so much who owns it because it's, it could be, um, it's already available for anyone to use and to modify. Does that make sense? Okay. You, you could have a private company um, develop open source software and then it would be then anyone in the 
public would be able to use that. I mean, I guess I'm just so concerned because of who historically has been owning our voting systems, you know. Right, so. right. So, yes, we do want it to be publicly owned, and yes. Hi there. Um, there's been quite a bit of talk on Twitter about open source and even really a debate about whether it's wise. Um, my concern, I'm not a tech person, but I, a lot of people that I've met um, through Twitter have chimed in on this issue, and it's my understanding that open source really does not in any way prevent hacking. It's not any more secure. Um, yes, the, the code itself may be open to the public, but there are multiple points of entry where the average member of the public would have, and really most people would have no idea to know whether that open source, source code is actually what is used on election day. Um, it could be hacked upon installation, it could be hacked upon repair, it could be hacked, um, you know, the tabulators, what, that there are many different places, and I'm very concerned that, um, to me, if you're going to go with open source, I see really only one benefit, well, two. Number one, cost. Number two, it, it eliminates the argument on a, um, that you can't get a forensic audit because the code is proprietary, so after the fact, after there's been a hack, maybe a court will rule in your favor if you have open source, maybe they still won't. Um, but I wanted to see, I'm concerned that whenever people talk about open source, they, the, the notion of a hand audit isn't discussed. And to me, that should really be the focal point number one. Um, I'd rather have hand counted elections. I know there's a huge debate whether those are viable. But if you're not gonna have that, you certainly need to have the hand counted audits. And do you agree that that's true even with open source? Yes. Yes, I think, um, as you notice, I didn't list security as one of the problems that I thought open source would solve. And it, you're absolutely right. Um, all the same security precautions that would need to be in place for a proprietary system would also need to be in place for an open source system. And different people have different opinions on this issue, but my opinion is that open source voting is not necessarily more secure than, than proprietary um, software or proprietary systems. So yes, if, if there is an open source paper ballot voting system, you still would need to have the same audit procedures in place to ensure the integrity of the election. And then just a follow-up question, well, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. If you could make sure every time you talk about open source sort of to the public, that they understand that it doesn't eliminate the need for a hand audit, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. People think that they get open source, maybe not in California, it sounds like, or maybe not in San Francisco, but elsewhere, people think if they get open source, that suddenly means that they're good to go. And um, they're not. Yeah, so, thank I you. D definitely agree with you, thanks. And yeah. So this is really just follows up on her, on her comments, because this is all new to me. Um, so even if, one, even if a, a jurisdiction had an open source system, it, all those other policies and legislation and regulations that would protect the integrity of the election would still need to be developed and passed in parallel with that. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah, I, I would do want to kind of emphasize something I said earlier in that one of the advantages of open source voting system is that we could potentially make it easier to, you know, it could facilitate some of the better auditing practices that we want to move towards. Because um, right now, I, from, what I, from what I understand, some of the, a lot of the proprietary systems out there don't even support some of the auditing systems that we wanted to, if we, even if we wanted to do them. So um, it gives us more flexibility. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't hear you talk before. Uh, before today, because uh, you know, recently Chelsea Manning was the guest honoree at Electronic Frontier Foundation at Delancey Street, and Electronic Frontier Foundation is a great group to have on your side because they're all geeks and lawyers, and pretty well funded these days, and they do give out grants. And then the other thing you should show up—it's coming up very shortly this month is the Internet Archive out on Funston in San Francisco is having their big gala, and that's a bunch of people you should be in touch with and give your card and Good flyers and so on. Thank you. October 11th, 5.30 p.m. At the Internet Archive's office in San Francisco. Yeah, uh, Michael Feinstein again, Santa Monica. You mentioned it being certified in San Francisco, and of course we all remember how long it took to get San Francisco's RCV certified by the SOS. 
why doesn't the SOS have to sign off on open source in San Francisco? Well, uh, by law, systems used in California do need to be certified. There's one exception where if a system is used in a pilot project in less than half of the, well, less than half of the components or precincts, um, it can be approved without certification as long as certain auditing techniques are used. But um, as far as getting it actually certified, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Secretary of State will be supportive in case it requires doing a little bit outside the box in terms of certifying, because I know there's many obstacles with the way certification is currently done. And um, the, the one unfortunate point, though, is that the Secretary of State has not been, um, I wouldn't say he's been supportive of open source per se. He's kind of, um, he acknowledges that it has some positive aspects, but he hasn't expressed to favor it over, over a proprietary system. He was born that way, Alex Bidia. I'm sorry, I, he was, that's it. I've been following him for, for a couple of years now. So, so um, on, in open source, I'm a big fan of open source because uh, one, uh, there are more eyes watching the software to babysitting the software because it's a part of you, you know, as a, as a developer. So what happens to the baby, you're very concerned about. So that's a big deal. Uh, my big question and, and my support would come, uh, when, you, when I saw the EFF logo up there, uh, understanding and knowing EFF and, and uh, speaking to it, attending their conferences and their workshops and stuff, they're amazing in the sense that they, yeah, they're geeks, and they're security geeks, uh, but more so they're always watching. Um, have they pledged, how much support, you know, it's one thing to put a, a logo up there, how much support, if this happens and you get the money, how much support will you get from them? Will they actually come on board and say, we're going to go ahead and monitor your firewalls and take care of your databases and, and what have you? Well, these are all still questions, and I would, I would love it if a lot of these organizations were to lend financial support or, or technical expertise, but um, if anyone has connections with these groups, it would help to, to help make that happen. Um, up to this point, you know, none of these organizations have made that offer yet. Well, first off, I'm a big fan of open source as being in the toolbox, and I want to thank you for what you're doing on it, because we must have it. Thank you. But it's a part of the toolbox. And my question about the system, and, I, and I'm wondering if this is how it's going to work, is most of the equipment that you're going to wind up using is probably going to be off-the-shelf scanners and things like that that really take out these huge corporations that are being, you know, controlled by this group or that group or, you know. The, uh, so I think it's wonderful. And, uh, and I hope we get to it. And, of course, it's all about getting to the audit and the original ballot. You know, even with ballot imaging, which we are going to wind up producing, which the whole country is going to have, right now it's 45% of the country has it, uh, is to have a tool that those images could be put online and that I could download them and then download an application. And then I take that app and I fill it out and then I can watch the computer count it. And then when I get done, I can take those images, march them over to the election department, say, hey, I want to use Dr. Phil Stark's method uh, with the ping pongs or whatever, and I want to match up against the originals because if they're done right, the image is married to the original ballot. And this is about getting to the originals. And, and what you're doing, I want to be a supporter. I work all over different parts of the country, and, and I want to thank you for what you're doing on this. Thank you very much. That's even better. We need more language. Last question. Hi. I'm wondering uh, what work is being done to assure that any open source observer who detected something amiss would have any standing whatsoever to get the attention of an election official? Yeah, good, good question. So this is a question that we haven't really started looking at yet, but it's a, a valid one. It's, it's for later on. But um, I would say this is the type of issue that this technical advisory committee is gonna be, can advise on. And how do you deal with um, you know, disclosure of security vulnerabilities, for example, or how do you handle members of the public giving feedback on the code. So I would say it's still an open question. So not a solution, but just an avenue to make things more public. Yes.
Thanks again.